Welcome, everybody. It is so nice to be here with you all today. We are taking a virtual field trip today with NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. And I am here today with our special guest, Kelly Williamson, who will also help us along on our chat as we take our tour through Chandra's high energy universe. We are going to start out with a poll because I like to make sure everybody has a little interactivity during this session. So if we could go ahead and launch poll number one. The question that we'd like to start off with is, if given the opportunity, would you want to go into space? Perhaps you might like to take a trip to the space station. Perhaps you might like to take a trip to the moon or even Mars. But if so, go ahead and put your answer in there. And if not, that is just fine too. And so far we have 100% saying yes. If there are any naysayers around in the crowd, please go ahead and feel free to put in no thanks. Looks like we are still 100% yes. <laughs> so that is wonderful to see. Um, let's go ahead and close out the poll and share the results. The reason that I start off with that question is um, I am not an astronaut. I have never left this wonderful big blue marble that we happen to live in and on. However, I did indeed want to be an astronaut when I was very young. However, it turns out that I have a very weak stomach and can like barely handle more than the swings at our local amusement park. So for me, a life in the stars is just absolutely not in the cards. So I get to learn about our big, huge universe from right here down on earth. And I'm very happy to do so, but I am really happy to see we have so many explorers here with us today. So, um, what is my own path like? Well, I am actually a visualization scientist and I started out in biology and then went into computer science before eventually making my way here to working for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. I've been working for Chandra since before it launched. So I started back in 1998. And truly for me, coding was a key that really helped unlock that high energy universe that we'll be talking more about today. So as much as I'm gonna talk about Chandra, I'm also gonna talk about coding. And please feel free at any time to put a question in the chat. These sessions tend to run for about 50 minutes or more. And I know some of you are on shorter class time. So if you would like to have your students' questions answered as we're going along, if you put them in the chat, Kelly will be able to answer them, or I will try to pop in myself as well. Um, but please do feel free to go ahead and keep, a, keep the notes coming in the chat. So Chander was launched back in 1999, and I can tell you with truth that, you know, it is exciting to be part of a NASA mission at any time in its lifetime, but I think being part of a mission before something launches is particularly exciting. I mean, it is nail-biting exciting because you are sending a very dear piece of equipment up into outer space and most likely to never be accessed by humans again. So Chander was launched back in 1999, as I said, and I wanted to just play a short video for you from Eileen Collins. She was the commander of the NASA space shuttle mission that brought Chandra up into its orbit. And she has this brief little message to share. I'm Eileen Collins commander of Space Shuttle Mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators, we did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. We weren't nervous, we were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th was due to a problem on the space shuttle, and then the second launch delay was two days later, and that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like to be in a space shuttle launch? It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage 
when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment. Our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. So just a really lovely message from Eileen, who was the first woman to ever command a NASA space shuttle mission and a pilot before that, and just a really cool, cool person to work with. So we talked about how to launch Chandra, and I just wanted to give you another perspective of someone who was there. This is Dr. Belinda Wilkes, who is until recently um, the director of the Chandra X-ray Center for the past few years. And here is what she has to say the launch experience was like from on the ground. Less than one minute away now from the 95th space shuttle launch. 35 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. When Chandra went up on the shuttle, so the shuttle basically lit up the sky like daylight for a couple of minutes as it went up. And the ground underneath our feet shook. Five, four, three. We have a go for engine start. Zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. We were two or three miles away. So it's just an amazing feeling of, of the power that is needed to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, which we needed to do to get in orbit. And also amazing to think that mankind can actually do this. It's very um, satisfying and exciting to see the results of all the years and all the people who've worked on Chandra and finally it goes up. So just a really, I think, lovely description of what it's like to have presence at a launch like that and how it feels like the ground will literally shake beneath your feet because it takes so much power to blast off beyond our atmosphere. So what is this space telescope that was launched back in July of 1999, NASA's Chandra X Observatory? It is a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope, which you might have heard of as well. Chandra goes about a third of the way to the moon so that it can observe X-rays from the universe and capture that information. Chandra is about the size of a school bus. So it was a very, very massive payload that was pretty much just barely fit into NASA's um, shuttle Columbia's payload bay and made the mission a little bit more dangerous than it might have been just because of the sheer size of that spacecraft. So Chandra has been observing our high energy universe ever since, looking at things like exploding stars, things like areas around black holes, things like colliding galaxies and interacting galaxies, things like young stars, things like old stars, just so much in the universe to learn about thanks to Chandra's high energy vision. So it's really important that we have telescopes that look at different kinds of light in the sky. We're going to go ahead and launch our second poll to find out a little bit more of the type of lights that you're familiar with. The entire electromagnetic spectrum is made up of many different kinds of light from radio waves all the way up to gamma rays. So our second poll for you today is which kind of light have you ever used or interacted with, or just perhaps even known of in your own life? And you can check any that apply. The options are infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, and visible light. So just a few kinds. And it looks like 100% of you are familiar with and have used visible light, but I see additional answers coming in in support of ultraviolet light, x-ray light, Thank you. And also infrared light as well. So it looks like all the different kinds of light at least have some people uh, in their corners that have either used them or interacted with them or perhaps um, at least known of them. 
So many thanks for filling out poll number two. Um, Kelly, if you want to go ahead and share the results of the poll, and then you can close out of that whenever you feel like it's time. But so it's really useful to be able to talk about these different kinds of light that we have access to. All of these different kinds of light exist in our universe, and it's like having different kinds of tools in the astronomer's tool belt to be able to use a specific kind of telescope that can capture a different kind of light. Because X-ray light is very, very different to capture than say radio light. For X-rays, our Earth's sort of superpower or one of Earth's superpowers is that it has a very protective atmosphere. And that protective atmosphere around Earth protects humans and other organisms from that high energy radiation for the most part, which is great for us, right? It was a perfect type of environment for us to be able to evolve into. But being able to capture X-rays of the universe means that Chandra had to wait for the space age because we had to launch above Earth's atmosphere to be able to capture all that X-ray goodness that is out there in the universe. But there are many different kinds of light that we can use in our daily lives as well. So you're probably familiar with X-ray light as it seems about 88% of you were. If you've ever gone to say the dentist or the doctor and had X-rays taken of your tooth or a bone because X-rays can penetrate through the skin and tissue down to the bone or to see inside the tooth, for example, to see if there is a cavity forming. You're probably also familiar with, say, microwave light. Uh, you might have used a microwave to disturb the water molecules in your food to heat it up very quickly. You've probably used uh, infrared light to be able to talk between devices, such as using a remote control to turn on your television. So there are all of these different kinds of ways that we use different kinds of light in our everyday life. And astronomers do the same thing in the scientific life, if you will. So using different kinds of light in order to discover and answer different kinds of questions. Our next slide, I just wanted to take you on a brief tour of some of my very favorite sites to see in the universe. All of these images that we'll be looking at include Chandra X-ray information, but you'll also see some with data from the Hubble Space Telescope, from the Spitzer Space Telescope, from radio telescopes as well, because again, it's like having different tools in your tool belt or different crayons in your crayon box to be able to color your universe with. So we're gonna be looking at all different kinds of objects, starting with the one on the screen now, which is the Eagle Nebula, and essentially is this beautiful stellar nursery where baby stars are forming in front of inside those tall columns of gas and dust. And young stars are a great place to be able to capture X-rays because there's all of that tumultuous energy coming off of them. Things like clusters of stars because stars are kind of like teenagers and they like to hang out together when they're young and sometimes when they're older as well. Mature stars, for example, that might explode perhaps sometimes in our lifetime or perhaps not for another 500 years or so. This system known as Eta Carina is a double star system. And if it does explode sometime in our lifetime, fear not, we are at a perfectly safe distance from it. Other types of stars that are in the process of dying, these are called planetary nebulas and are sort of like a glimpse of what our sun could look like in say four or more billion years, that's billion with a B. So we have lots and lots of time with our sun as it is. But stars like our sun that are kind of medium sized puff off their outer layers as their fuel starts to run out. And they create these beautiful structures that are called planetary nebulas for no good reason as being anything connected to planets, but just because a long time ago when they were first discovered, people thought they were planets. So planetary nebulas are some really incredible structures to look at, but also kind of give you a glimpse of what our own star could be doing sometime in the future. I also really love to look at exploding stars, supernova remnants. They are one of my favorite types of objects in the universe, and they are simply spectacular to be able to look at, but are also chock full of science goodness so that we can learn about how stars change and evolve. And supernovas are my favorite, as I mentioned, so we've got a few of those to look at. Chandra also gets to look at things like the areas around black holes. This, for example, is what the very central core of our own Milky Way galaxy looks like. And in the lower right side of the screen, there's a bright white area, and that is where Sagittarius A star, our very own supermassive black hole, is sort of cloaked in all of that bright X-ray light.
Chandra gets to look at many other kinds of galaxies as well beyond our own galaxy, such as galaxies like this one, which is M106, beautiful spiral structure and very interesting anomalous kinds of arms. Galaxies that are interacting and creating very interesting shapes for us to look at, like exclamation marks and cartwheels and whirlpools, things that have massive, super massive uh, black holes with these really incredible jets streaming out of them from the centers of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies are the largest gravitational bound objects in our universe and essentially consist of about tens or hundreds or even thousands of galaxies all enveloped in this cushion of really high energy gas clouds. And of course, some of those might even look like they're smiling back at us here on Earth thanks to gravitational lensing. So our universe is truly incredible. And Chandra has been an absolute workhorse in the time that it's been launched for over 20 years now. It's traveled over 3 billion kilometers. It's taken over 3,000 trips around our planet. It's collected 25 trillion bytes of data. And humans on Earth have uploaded and written about 4 million lines of code in order to either operate Chandra, collect Chandra's data, or analyze the data here on Earth. So I'd like to just take a moment to listen to Sabina Hurley. She is another awesome colleague. She is our flight operations team manager. And here's what she has to say about how hard it was just to even make Chandra. Here we go. They knew the science that they wanted to do. The technology to do it didn't actually exist. Countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smooth to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth, and they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together, right? And they are now focusing on an instrument, and the instrument chips are only four inches square. And you have to hit that four inch square every single time, and that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's gonna operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing but then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind blowing. I think Sabina has such a nice way with words there. So Chandra is truly an exquisite piece of equipment. And because it goes a third of the way to the moon, it had to operate perfectly right from out of the gate. So how do we capture information of that high energy universe, those X-ray photons, those packets of X-ray light that are traveling for thousands, millions, or billions of light years. Well, we have that object in the universe that we're interested in studying, and Chandra is slowly turned towards it. It's called slewing, and it moves about as slowly as the second hand on a clock. That object is then in Chandra's field of view, and it captures that information, those photons that I mentioned, and then it's recorded at the base of the telescope. The scientific instruments are located down there, and then finally, it's packaged up into a suitcase of binary code, ones and zeros, as that's like the way that Chandra gets to talk to um, the other pieces of equipment. And so then it's sent down through NASA's Deep Space Network, which is a series of three radio dishes positioned around the world. There's one in Australia, one in Madrid, and one in California. And Chandra gets to talk to those dishes about every eight hours. That suitcase of information, that suitcase of binary code, eventually then makes its way through to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California before eventually finally making its way to one of our laptops here in New England. And then from there, we get to do some cool stuff with the data. 
So at this point, I'm going to take you on a brief virtual tour of the control center. Uh, the control center is where that data all lands after it comes through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, behind me, actually, is a little screen capture of what the control center looks like. I am not there today, but we'll be all taking a brief virtual tour. Kelly, could you confirm that you can see the operations control center and that you see us moving through the OCC? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so right here is the view of the control center right as you step off of the elevators, essentially. There's this beautiful room that you sort of walk into with space for meeting and relaxing. Up ahead is the main conference room. Whenever there's something exciting going on or big meetings have to occur, that's where they are. Behind you, there is this kind of faded looking poster on the wall. That is actually a cloth banner that we designed to be launched with the astronauts back in 1999. And they took it up with them in space and they got to sort of take their um, communications calls in front of it, took some pictures in front of it, and then very kindly brought it back down to us uh, here on earth where we got to display it on the wall. And you can see in the corner, there is a small version of the Chandra spacecraft and that's at about 10% size because Chandra is about the size of a school bus. And there are some really lovely Chander images on the wall. If at any point you want to learn a little bit more about the control center, the URL for this virtual tour is in the chat and you can go ahead and open it up at any point for yourself and also read any of the little cue cards that we have positioned throughout. Now, as we turn back down towards the elevators, we're going to go down this first corridor. Down the corridor, there's actually a mini exhibit, if you will, of the history behind Chandra. Chandra started as an idea in the late 60s and then was essentially uh, funded and then built and then finally tested and launched throughout the 80s into the 90s, as I said, launching in 1999. So there's quite a bit of its history over there on the wall. We are going to go into the main control room, however, which is usually everybody's favorite room to visit. Again, that's what's pictured behind me on my Zoom background. And you can see here is the main control center. And I will say during the pandemic, things definitely had to change for the control center as we had to greatly restrict who could come in. This is already a restricted space, but they took a lot of health and safety protocols to make sure all the people that needed to be where they were supposed to be in order to take care of the Chandra spacecraft were able to do so in a safe and healthy way. And there was no disturbance of operations of any kind during the pandemic. Someone always has to be there to take care of Chandra and someone always was. So Chandra operations continued on beautifully. One of the first desks that you see over here on the right is the lead spacecraft engineers console. That is the desk where the lead spacecraft uh, engineer gets to sit. And that person is essentially responsible for coordinating all the routine and non-routine um, spacecraft activities. Over here on the left is the um, command controllers console. And that person is making sure that all the commands that are going to the Chandra spacecraft, they're coming from that desk and they're all thoroughly checked and ready to go. In front of that, there are two additional rows of consoles. The second row is for the spacecraft subsystem engineers. So that's um, essentially the Chandra spacecraft is split up into various subsystems or functions or different areas of responsibility that people have. And each engineer in this row has one particular part of the spacecraft to take care of. And then finally, in this front row of consoles, that is where the science instruments teams are, both the ACES and the HRC teams are located in those rows and they get to be only responsible for those very important science instruments. Then up here in the front row, you'll see quite a few different kinds of screens to be able to look at. On the left is a location of Chandra's orbit. There are a whole bunch of vital statistics. There's the discussion that Chander gets to have with NASA's Deep Space Network, those radio dishes that I mentioned. You'll be able to see on that screen, for example, when Chander is talking to one of those dishes and which dishes it would be. Chander does get to do the downlinking or uplinking about every eight hours, as I mentioned. And then there's also the additional information of where Chander is in its orbit, um, what its telemetry is, 
or what the temperature is. Essentially, this is our way of taking Chandra to the doctor, right? We can't ever physically access Chandra, but we can take its vital signs. We can take its blood pressure, if you will. We can take its temperature. We can display all that information on the screen. And then if something needs to be addressed, if something needs to be fixed, or if we just need to tell Chandra what to do for the day, we upload all of those lines of code. Those lines of code are then received by the spacecraft and then send it on its merry way in order to do its job. So when you're looking at the screen, you're getting all of that really vital information. And you'll see up on that top area, there are all those different green blocks on that that main screen, that is telling us that Chandra is in good health. So if one of those blocks were to turn red, for example, that would tell us, hmm, something needs to be addressed. So this sort of wall of monitors is really important for us to be able to take care of the Chandra spacecraft. So I'm just gonna turn us all around and then make one sort of quick stop towards the end. Um, as we get ready to leave, I think I'll zoom a little closer, but right here on the wall, there is this little section of art where some of the staff members like to draw to keep each other entertained. And right now the message is saying, keep it up, Chandra Ops. And I guess that is in reference to making sure keeping Chandra up in space, which is where it needs to be to operate. So that is what the control center looks like. If you go back out here, there's more to see both for exhibits and for other rooms, but I think we'll probably stop there, though there is one additional space down here. We won't go inside, but we can see right down here is a sleeping room. So when there is inclement weather or emergencies of any kind, there is a sleeping room so that staff can safely stay around, uh, say during a New England blizzard, and still make sure that they can do their job to take care of the Chandra spacecraft. We're gonna do another brief tour, this time of the Chandra spacecraft. And this time we are going to launch um, with the help of my friend and colleague, April Jubet, And she is going to teach us about the various parts on Chandra. Hopefully you can hear this as I play it. Welcome to NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Click anywhere on the screen to orbit the spacecraft and see it from all angles. Clicking will move you along to another stop on the tour. Chandra is almost 14 meters long, about the size of a school bus. It is only centimeters smaller than the largest payload the space shuttle could carry. X-rays are too energetic to bounce off traditional mirrors like we use to see our reflection. Instead, Chandra has nested, barrel-shaped mirrors that allow the X-rays to skip like a pebble across a pond and then focus on the detector 10 meters away. Chandra uses cameras and spectrometers at its target to analyze the X-rays coming from deep space. Chandra's solar panels collect power for the telescope's detectors and its radio communication with the Earth. The electricity is also used to heat the mirrors to keep them from deforming in the cold temperatures of space. In order to provide motion to the observatory, Chandra has two different sets of thrusters. Chandra aims with high precision gyroscopes. The antennas on Chandra are its link to NASA's deep space network, a series of three radio dishes located at different parts of Earth. Once on Earth, the system delivers the data to the Chandra X-ray Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
So again, as mentioned, Chandra is about the size of a school bus, but packs an awful lot of punch in that size. And so I mentioned earlier that idea of binary code, that suitcase of digital information that Chandra gets to be able to use as a way of communicating with us down here on Earth. So binary code is a system of talking to machines because telescopes in space like Chandra, as well as many other devices, need to use some sort of system to be able to communicate with each other. So we use binary code to be able to talk to laptops, to talk to spacecraft, to talk to smart refrigerators and smart toasters these, these days. It's the idea of those ones and zeros in binary code. It's like a representation of the ons and offs. And ons and offs are great because that's what electrical devices uh, sort of identify identify with that state of either on or off. After we have all of that delicious binary code to be able to unpack from that suitcase, we can take that information and translate it into a table of information using um, some kind of coding or software, for example, so that we have the time, the location, the energy of each little photon, each packet of energy that struck Chandra's detector during the observations. Once we then have that table, we can use more software or more coding to be able to translate that information into, for example, an image, the representation of what that object looks like in space, in x-ray light. And then we use more software and more coding to be able to fine tune that data, to be able to represent that scientific story that we're trying to tell. So for example, the very first object we ever released from Chandra, it was called Cassiopeia A. It's an exploded star, which you might recall are my favorite objects in the entire universe. It's when a star many times the size of our sun, much more massive, at least eight, nine or so times more massive than our sun, starts to get old, it runs out of fuel, and then its core collapses and it explodes its guts out all over the universe. So what we're seeing here is a very early glimpse of what the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant looked like. It's about 10,000 thousand light years away from us, where a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, or about 10 trillion kilometers. And just one hour of information captured with Chandra of that exploded star, and this is what we have to look at. Now we can fast forward to today, and now we have over 2 million seconds worth of data of this object, because it's very scientifically important to us. And it's also one of the objects that we use to make sure Chandra stays calibrated or functioning really well. And so now you can see that we have so much more information of this exploded star. And we've been able to color code it like you would code, say, a map on the nightly news or on a, a weather map. If you have a map that is color coded to wind speed, for example, you'll see the higher speeds might be colored to, to red and the lower speeds might be colored to say yellow. Well, in this case with Cassiopeia A, we've color coded the different kinds of chemical elements um, from that emission. So for example, the iron is color coded in purple and you can see pockets of that on the lower left side and on the upper areas as well. So it's a way to extrapolate a lot of science information from that data. But when you have really good data of things like exploded stars that are relatively nearby, this is essentially on a different parts of our Milky Way galaxy. So it's in our own galactic neighborhood, if you will. We can take that data and we can figure out which of the information is moving away from us and which of that information is moving towards us by using something called the Doppler effect. And we can create a 3D model that represents how that information is distributed. And that's what we see on the screen here, a really cool 3D model the very first one we were able, ever able to do using data or observational information of this exploded star Cassiopeia A. Once we have a 3D model, we can use more coding, more software to be able to 3D print it. We can use yet more coding to be able to bring it into virtual reality. This is one of my students and she's getting to walk around inside that star that exploded, Cassiopeia A, our good friend that's 10,000 light years away, 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers, and she's walking around inside it virtually. We can also take that information and translate it into sound. So this is not capturing what it sounds like in space. This is taking the data that we've already gotten, and instead of using it to create just an image, we can use it instead to create a soundscape so that we can learn more about this remnant and we can also communicate it with others, perhaps those who are either blind or low vision in another way. And this is what it sounds like when we translate Cassiopeia A's image into sound.
Now I'm pretty biased, but I think it makes a pretty beautiful sound and it really sort of helps also demonstrate the idea that this exploded star, this remnant is still expanding into space. And again, as I mentioned, is made up of all those different kinds of chemical elements. So let's listen to Dr. Belinda Wilkes one more time as she talks about why it's important to do these things. We are on this tiny little planet next to a very ordinary star that's in the middle of its life in a fairly normal spiral galaxy in some corner of the universe. And the universe is huge and there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And yet we are sitting on this earth and we're able to understand at least some of what we're seeing by just looking. I really enjoy how she phrases that because it's true. We're learning about um, a part of the universe, this X-ray light that no human can ever see naturally or directly. X-ray light is invisible to human eyes, but we can learn about it by taking that Chandra telescope and pointing it at different regions in space and looking out at that different kind of light and then sending it back to earth with all of its sciencey goodness so that we can extrapolate and analyze and learn about it here on earth. So what do we use in order to make all of that happen? Well, we use quite a few different kinds of computer languages for Chandra. Chandra, as I mentioned, was built um, over the course of about two decades. So that means we definitely have a hodgepodge of different kinds of computer languages that we use in order to operate Chandra and that we use in order to be able to do that analysis of the information. So everything from Fortran and Perl to Python and MATLAB to Java and Visual Basic, we use modern languages like C Sharp and Unity scripting to be able to take that information and translate it into virtual reality. We use JavaScript and other scripting languages to do a host of things, but these different computer languages all serve a real purpose for Chandra's mission. So we are going to take our final poll of today if Kelly wants to go ahead and launch poll number three. But the question is, have you ever tried coding? And your answers are pretty simple, indeed yes, or perhaps not yet. It looks like so far we have 100% saying indeed yes. And yep, that percentage is staying at 100%, which is lovely to see. I learned how to code just starting with HTML. That was my very first language. And I think some people don't even consider it a language, but I do, because I was really excited to be able to learn something and apply it with my own two hands to make my very first web page, which was ugly and hideous, but I loved it regardless. Um, it was part of my work study program in college and learning it for that purpose was really, really useful because it sent me on a whole different path that eventually brought me here working for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. So it looks like everybody said indeed yes, which is fantastic. I hope you all keep learning new computer languages. For me, it's like learning a new language, how to speak, whether that's French or Mandarin or anything else, an incredibly useful tool. Let's see, I'm gonna hand things over to Kelly at this point to give us a tour of various kinds of resources you can do in your class with NASA's Universe of Learning. So we have many um, amazing and fun activities to help you explore coding and space science. Um, just a quick note to our educators. If you participate in an hour of code, you'll see that many of these activities fit nicely into that. Uh, one of our first activities here is how to talk to spacecrafts, where you'll learn to write your name in binary code and create beaded pins and bracelets with secret binary messages. Um, there's also a new activity called Binary Beats, where you create music based on binary code. Recoloring the Universe uh, is computer-based with follow-along videos. You'll learn basic coding skills and use actual Chandra data on exploded stars star forming regions and black holes. Tinkercad um, is probably something a lot of you have used. This activity takes uh, you through a series of the basics of 3D modeling and astronomy. You can start with some basic shapes, create an earth moon system, and work your way up to using actual NASA data to create exploded stars. 
you have access to a 3D printer, our 3D printing the X-ray universe module is for you. Here you'll be able to download files and print models of supernovas, pulsars, and even a model of the Chandra spacecraft itself. Each section has images, movies about each object. And then toward the end, you'll see an example of the model and the files you'll need. JS9 is an online data image analysis program. It's actually used by professional astronomers. Um, the student-friendly software has tutorials and activities that explore deep sky objects in depth. We also have a new uh, free augmented reality app called Reach Across the Stars, where you can explore the universe and unlock the often overlooked stories of women in space science. They're featured short stories that are about one to two minutes and even longer journeys. And in these journeys, you can ask questions, listen to interviews and explore 360 degree virtual reality content. For instance, you can get a behind the scenes look at the Mars 2020 rover with Christine Hernandez, an instrument engineer at NASA's JPL. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science, but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions, and how to use my ability as a collaborator, as a leader, as a team player, to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. So I know that's a lot of info, but I'll put the links uh, into the chat box and you can explore them later at your own leisure. Thanks, Kelly. That was great to see. I think it's really cool to have opportunities to work with the data that I get to work with every day, but to be able to bring it to your classrooms, to your clubs and whatever. I want to just start to end the presentation at this point. We're going to have a brief note from Dr. Daniel Castro, another colleague that we work with, who's going to talk about how much Chandra has really learned about our universe. And then we'll have some final words before we go to questions and answers. So here is Daniel. We didn't know that stars could emit x-rays, for example, and the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up. We didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. So as Daniel mentioned, Chandra has really learned an awful lot about the universe, but as is the case with anything in astronomy, pretty much anytime you answer one question, you get about 10 new questions in its place to have to research. So it is a field that keeps people on their toes to be sure. So. I hope you have enjoyed taking this virtual tour with us through the Operations Control Center and through the Chandra Telescope. There's an additional tour that takes you through the 3D model of Cassiopeia A that I presented as well, our very good friend that exploded star. Feel free to do those at your leisure. And I hope you have enjoyed time traveling with us today because all of these images of the universe, all of this data that we've been collecting, it's like being able only to look at baby pictures in your your graduating seniors yearbook. All of that information has traveled a long way to reach us, which means we're only looking at things as they were and never really as they are. So if you have enjoyed time traveling from the comfort of your own desks and chairs at school or wherever you happen to be today, I hope you'll let us know. We will be sending out an email that has a recording link from today and then also has a feedback form. It is very, very much appreciated if you will fill out that feedback form because if we're doing a good job with this type of presentation or if we're not, we would like to know. And that kind of support does indeed help us keep doing these types of projects. So. It's always better to know how we're doing than not. So please do take some time to fill that out. 
And yes, with that, I would just like to say again, thanks for journeying with us. Coding has been a really important part of my career. It's a fantastic way to learn to speak these other languages. And I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. All of the URLs, as Kelly mentioned, should be in the chat and they're here on the screen as well. We hope you take advantage of these um, different kinds of activities that we've got. And let's go ahead and see if there are any questions left over in the chat to answer. Um, let's see, is it fun working there? Yes, I would say it is fun working there. And you know, I've worked here for 23 years. And I think if I can say it's fun after 23 years, then it's perhaps a pretty cool place to be able to work. For me, what I enjoy most about working here is not only the people that I get to work with, but also this idea that we get to learn something new, like literally every day we are learning something new. And I definitely enjoy that. I'm constantly having to learn new techniques, um, new different languages to code in, all of these different things because technology keeps advancing, the science gets more exciting, and yeah, it really keeps us on our toes. So. I do indeed like being able to work here. And Kelly, I don't want to answer for you. Do you like working here? No pressure. I, <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love working for Chandra. Um, before working with Chandra, I worked with Hubble. And so space has been a big part of my life uh, since I was young. Uh, looks that like we fabulous. have a question from someone else, Kim. A uh, student uh -huh. would like to know, how does Chandra avoid black holes? Oh, that's a great question. So black holes are probably my second favorite thing in the universe outside of exploding stars, which are number one near and dear to my heart. Black holes, I think, have this reputation for kind of zooming around our universe like cosmic Roombas, you know, these little vacuum cleaners. Um, but to be honest, black holes, for the most part, do a good job of kind of staying where they belong. So for us here on Earth and in our solar system, Chandra only goes a third of the way to the moon. So it's actually staying pretty close to home. It is far for us because going a third of the way to the moon these days is pretty far, um, but it doesn't actually really go beyond that. And within our local solar system environment of our, you know, planets and sun and comets and all that, there's no close by black hole. So when we're looking at black holes of Chandra, we're looking at information that's pretty far away from us. For example, the black hole, the supermassive black hole at the central region of our very own galaxy, the Milky Way, is about 26,000 light years away. And again, the light year is the distance that light travels in a year or about 10 trillion kilometers. So 26,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. That means that that black hole is actually pretty far away from us. It's our nearest supermassive black hole, but indeed it is too far to pose any danger to us. So yeah, I think black holes sometimes get a bad rap for kind of going around sucking things up, but it's really not the case. Um, our own supermassive black hole, which is called Sagittarius A star, has its own location in our galaxy. It kind of sits there doing its thing with its own little orbit of things that are moving around it. What happens is that gravitational pull of that black hole is very, very powerful. So as things get too close, well, eventually they can fall in. And one thing you do not want to do is fall in into a black hole. Again, in no danger here on Earth, but if you did happen to visit Sagittarius A star 26,000 light years away, and if you did happen to fall in, you would be spaghettified. What that means is kind of like what it sounds, the very molecules in your body, you would be stretched out thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until you are essentially molecular spaghetti orbiting around that black hole, kind of falling into it and going past the point of no return, at which point, all done. So very exciting things, black holes, but actually they usually like to mind their own business. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. And um, Kelly, any other last questions before we wind We've down for today? One more question. Um, what happens when two galaxies crash together? Oh, that's a lovely question too. So yeah, you know, space is really, really big, right? The universe is huge. And there's a lot of empty space in space. There's a lot of space in space. However, 
there is still so much stuff in the universe and lots of things are attracted to each other because of those gravitational pulls. So galaxies can indeed interact with each other. So sometimes galaxies can be kind of nearby, have like close neighbors, and then the gravitational pull of one might be stronger than the other because it's more massive perhaps. And as those two galaxies kind of start dancing closer and closer together, eventually they can merge. And what happens is this this occurs over a very long period of time. But as those galaxies merge, the supermassive black holes at their cores eventually, we believe, merge as well to create a larger supermassive black hole. But I think what is also interesting about that is if Earth, for example, was to, well, I should say, if Earth, for example, was to be looking out on the night sky, and over the course of the next, say, four or five billion years, if our entire galaxy were to, say, collide with another galaxy like the Andromeda galaxy, that merging would take place in a very slow way. And to be honest, not that much would probably change for us here on Earth if we were still here, which is likely we wouldn't be because four or five billion years is a very long time. However, it takes that a long time and all of that space kind of combines and merges. And there's so much space in space, likely our own little corner of the galaxy might be okay. And maybe our night view of the sky would be changing, but not all that might else could change. So anyways, um, it sounds like quite a few people are signing off. Thank you very much for attending. You are very, very welcome that the students enjoyed it. I'm really happy to hear that. And again, please do go ahead and fill out the response so we know what works and what doesn't in these events. And that is all I have. Kelly, anything else from you before we sign off today? That's it. Wonderful. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and say a goodbye to everyone. Thanks again.